Hey, he's a... There was five apples in that tree, and when I went back to get the audio recorder the next morning, there was only two still stuck on that limb where that bell was. And that's what sounds to me like they're eating the apples right there. Right, right, right over top of the audio recorder. Welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Uh, with me today, I got a new guest, and I'm really looking forward to having him on here. And before we start off the show, let me remind you guys that uh, this is an entirely viewer-funded show. If you like the content on these shows and you want to uh, help continue to bring them forward so that you can enjoy them too, uh, you can always help us out at uh, paypal.me backslash world bigfoot central and also like i said in the last show now we we're partnering up with uh one of the best cbd producers on the planet and you can check that out at uh, my myctfocbd.com backslash duke sullivan and uh if you want to get yourself really high quality cbd products uh legal in all 50 states and many other countries and uh really realistic good prices and super high quality uh, refer back to the last episode where Cindy talked about it. She's been using it for a long time. It works great for her. And I'm looking forward to being uh, having my own uh, <clears throat> here shortly so that I can be like not in constant pain. But speaking of constant pain, here's somebody that has to deal with constant pain all the time. I've been looking forward to having this guy on the show for a while because uh, he's one of those guys that likes to go out and do a lot of field research. And it's always great to have the field researchers on here. And uh, he's one of those field researchers that has way more balls than common sense and will go out and do like a five-mile hike with a broken frickin' ankle. So <laughs> with that, let me bring on my very special guest, Jerry Klein. Welcome to the show, Jerry. How's it going there, Duke? It's going good, bud. It's, uh, I'm glad to have you on here finally. You know, it's uh, been quite a while. I've been uh trying to get in touch with you or get you on the show and we've been having some problems trying to get skype set up and everything i'm glad we finally got it resolved and we can get you on here and i think to start out with you should just introduce yourself to the people that don't already know who you are and uh tell everybody about your your organization and how you got involved in bigfooting well my name is jerry klein i started uh knox Co knox county bigfoot organization uh, sorry about that, guys. It's early in the morning. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Knox County Bigfoot Organization, I got that started from my very first sighting I had in Gambier, Ohio, which is here in Knox County. So Knox County Bigfoot in Knox County. And uh, that's in Ohio, and there's plenty of cryptid sightings in Ohio. You know, I'd almost be afraid to go out Bigfoot researching in Ohio because there's so many other weird things you could run into. Uh, but I'm sure you think about that occasionally. Um, so when, when, uh, what was your background? Um, you know, like, how did you actually end up getting involved in Bigfoot in the first place? Well, I, uh, as I've said before, I'm sure a lot of your uh, viewers on here know that I used to be a logger and, uh, did it for many years i was a skeptic you know um 
I had heard people asking me and stuff, different things, you know, uh, about, you know, have you seen anything in the woods, this and that and the other over the years? And I just kind of brushed it off, you know, but it was uh, in 013. Uh, it was the last weekend of August in 013. Um, I was getting ready. We got a gold claim down here in Gambier. It was one thirty in the morning, and and I had a cargo trailer. I I stayed in. I put my gold equipment in there and everything. But I had another trailer somebody had give me, and I had pulled it down there with my pickup truck because I had trailer camped out down there. But make long story short, I was I cleaned up the back of that that trailer that was given to me. It was a, a old firewood trailer, and I was just cleaning it out so I could sell it. It had a bunch of wood in the back of it, so I had a huge bonfire going. And then the next day, I was packing up and heading to, um, I was sticking that trailer up by the road on a landowner's property, told me to go ahead and stick it out there for sale, that, the wood trailer. And then um, I uh, had the fire going where I was burning all that wood out of the back of that uh, trailer, and I was planning on the next day going to another uh, they call it uh, Gold Rush Days and our other gold claim in Butler just north of where we're at there about uh, half an hour away and I was up 1.30 in the morning and I'm sitting there and I wanted to make sure no logs rolled off close to my cargo trailer and burnt it to the ground so yeah, no kidding. I said yeah <laughs> so I uh, just sat there and, you know kept the fire going poking around on it make sure it wouldn't go you know uh, get out of hand and uh, I heard splashing come down. At first I heard a tree break like tsh, like something grabbed a hold of a, a big limb or something and busted it over and then I heard steps into the water and I had you know one of them uh, big spotlights it's got the big uh, uh, it, they're LED now but uh, had the, the six volt battery inside of it kind of old-fashioned style but with the led lens of it. and they're pretty bright <laughs> but well, uh, it's kind of like square with a handle on top of it sort exactly of. Yeah. yeah yeah they are very bright that was before the the latest uh, wave of modern tech light uh yeah but for for the day those were very bright so go on so i'm sitting there in uh I I said, well, it's got to be a big buck, you know, because it's last week in August. I figured it'd be bucks and velvet, you know, and I'm a deer hunter, avid deer hunter, outdoorsman. And uh, <laughs> so I shine my light down there in the middle of the river, and there is this massive Bigfoot standing right in the middle of the river. His arms are down to his knees almost. Well, I'd say the tips of his fingers. Is almost down to his knees. He's standing there with one his right leg forward and his back. Uh, his left leg was back, and I I stopped him in mid stride. And I don't know what he was thinking of me being there, knowing I was there to come out and show himself. But prior to this, I had events happening to me down there at camp, and I was feeding them. So that was not a good idea at the time, but I didn't know nothing about that. I just knew I had weird, weird uh, things going on down there. So I was like, eh, you know, I wanted to try it out anyhow. So anyhow, he comes out there in the river and he's got his arms just draped down. He ain't making no gestures with his hands or anything. He's just standing there. And it seems like we're in a five five minute stare which was only for about four or five seconds before he went wah like that to me and he curled his upper lip and I could see his teeth and he had blocked teeth just like ours I didn't see no canines or anything right. that's when I jumped up out of my chair took off running run around my cargo trailer and I had a side door in that cargo trailer which I got I had you know uh the set of the double doors in the back, but you got to latch them down just like a semi trailer does. And um, when I run into that cargo trailer, the door is kind of short, 
And when I stepped up in there, I hit the corner of that door because it's got a outer frame around that door. And that corner caught my head. <laughs> and so I got in there, you know, I had a shotgun there and I racked a shell under the shotgun. I'm sitting there on my cot and I have it across my lap. And I'm waiting any time now for that cargo trailer just to be flipped over on its side. I sat there and sat there and sat there. And nothing happened. And I sat there. I don't know how long it was I sat there. I was sitting there shaking till I calmed down. But I didn't have, I didn't hear nothing. I had my little windows open. I had two little windows, one on each side of the cargo trailer. And it was tinted, but they was open, but I had slid them closed. And as I'm sitting there, I didn't hear nothing. So I finally fell back asleep. I just laid down there. And then when I woke up next morning, I felt my hair was all sticky and everything. And my pillow. And I looked around and there was blood all over my pillow. And then my hair. <laughs> Where you bashed yourself and you were so freaked out you didn't even realize it. Right, exactly. And uh, I had blood all over the place. It looked like uh, somebody had stuck a pig, you know. Oh, God. And so, and I'm laying on top of the shotgun. It's got, it's a Winchester uh, 12 gauge with a scope on it. I'm laying there on it and I'm like, what the hell? What the hell happened pain? last night? I'm sleeping on a loaded shotgun and there's blood all over my head. <laughs> so I get up and as soon as I get up and I'm like, okay, let's go outside and see what's going on. I see through the windows, it's daylight out there. So, I cracked the door open, unlock it, and crack it open. I got the shotgun, just like you'd see in one of these old movies, you know, where you see the old man pointing the shotgun out the door there, waiting to see what's going on, you know. I shove the door open at the end of the shotgun, and I look around, look around. So I get out there, look at, back at my camp, where the fire is going, you know. It's all smoldered down, but it was still going. And uh, I had a table there with the fold-out legs on one of plastic top tables. And I had three empty water jugs, one-gallon jugs, and they was all pointed indirectly towards each other, and one of them had the lid screwed off of it. And uh, that uh, there was other things there had been messed around with, but I couldn't tell if maybe if them or Coon had messed around there. But he had definitely come up to the camp after that incident, you know, of seeing him down there in the middle of the river. So, and he was that quiet. He, he nonchalantly snuck up there while he knew I was in that trailer. So, they knew. Well, you know, he knew they, where you were, but I mean, that's still really brazen after you put a light on him and saw him for him to still come up there afterwards. Right. So, uh, I got two questions about it. Like, first of all, you said you had been feeding. What did you think you were feeding? Did you, were you just leaving scraps out for the animals and weren't too sure what was eating them or what? No, I just... I noticed things like in my... You know, I got up one morning and the door of my pickup truck was open. And things had been gone through it. And I was like, who in the hell's going through my pickup truck? There's nothing in here. But the uh, glove box wasn't open or anything. But there was like, you know, empty pop cans, stuff like that, laying on the floorboard, water bottles. And they'd been strode out onto the ground. It was like, now who in the hell opens up my pickup truck door like that, you know? So I went down to Walmart at the time, and they had the digital recorders, but I didn't know nothing about it. You know what I mean? I never knew how to fool around with stuff like that. And I looked over, and by chance, they've got cassette recorders with a microphone that you can plug into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they had cassette tapes. Well, believe it or not, now Walmart is selling uh, record players. They're Victrolas, and <laughs> they're selling uh, albums of the uh, late rock and roll bands like ACDC, Led Zeppelin, but not to get off track here. So I got the cassette player, I set it in the pickup truck, and it had that uh, that uh, microphone. So what I did, I took that microphone out through the uh, the little, you know, little 
what they call the little vent window on the door. And I took that mic out there and then I hit it up underneath the windshield wiper of my pickup truck. So I had the windshield wiper just holding the mic down in directional out just towards the woods across the river where I was camping. So, and then next morning I had went to bed that night, you know, this was after I'd come back from the gold thing over there. And, you know, I had some friends there and, and other people there was telling me about some stuff that was happening around camp at the other gold claim. So, but that's another story to be told there. <laughs> so I got back there. I went and set up camp there again, finish off the summer, you know, gold prospect or whatever. So I set up that uh, cassette tape, you know, and um, I let it run that night. And I went to bed that night and everything. Got up next morning. Nothing had been touched around there, anything. And so I, I just, I said, well, I want to listen to that tape record because it only run for a couple hours. And then that's it on a cassette. Yeah. But in that couple hours, I got a, like two or three loud tree knocks. And that was after I'd went to bed. I just nonchalantly got in the truck, pushed play on there, closed the door, you know, and then messed around there, made, you know, look like I was, you know, uh, just my normal stuff, and then I went to bed. And then, uh, well, I sat there listening to that, and then I got a long howl way off in the distance. Well, I got to watch, and I got on, you know, I smartphone at the time, I got online there, and I started messing around with Bigfoot videos and everything, and I come across this one person, uh, her and her dog, how they get out and habituate uh, these creatures, you know, and uh, Bigfoot. And well, I can big see at that feet. point how you'd be putting two and two, <laughs> yeah, two and two together, because you got something that opened your damn truck. And, and and strew everything all over the place and wasn't trying to steal anything like a human would. And then you got wood knocks and you got a howl and you get online and it doesn't take very long to figure out that what that's indicative of Bigfoot. So at that point, you're pretty well sure that there's Bigfoot there then. Yeah. So, so what I did, I watched these, you know, different videos, people habituate them. And I was like, okay, I run up to the store and I got some Twizzlers. Some Reese cups, you know, the bags of them, like what come in for uh, Halloween. And I put the, I just, I would set out, I set the bag of Twizzlers out there, just opened the end of it. But I set them up in the crotch of a tree that was uh, about my head high. Not to say that a coon still couldn't get up there and get stuff, you know. Yeah. But I would take the Reese cups and lay them up there in different areas of the tree. And the next morning I would get back up again and I was actually recording these creatures at the same time is uh, I could hear them. I actually heard them in there arguing one time when I put out a, it was a half ham that had been in my cooler and I wasn't real sure about it, how long it had been there because the ice had went down. I put more ice back in it. I didn't know if the ham went bad or not. So I just stuck it out there, put it up in the tree. And these cassette tapes, to this day, I can't find them. I've got them strode all around the house here. I had them in a box, and since then, I had to use a box. And then I put them here and there. I can't find these tapes now. I had one good one. But as I was trying to do one of my YouTube videos, it got eat up on the tape recorder here. So, and but I mean, that happened to me plenty of times because I used to play with tape decks a lot. And oh man, is that irritating! It and especially is. when it's like something you don't have any other copy of, and it goes, <laughs> and you're like, no, 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 <laughs> and it yep. eats the tape and it shreds it, and you're like, ah, no. But I had, uh, it was a weird argument. It was almost like the Sierra sound of 
how you hear Ron Moorhead's uh, CD of the the one speaking real f- or, or or it was chattering real fast, and then they said it was a female arguing with it over food. This sounded exactly the same thing, and it was like you, you know you're talking since O thirteen that I come across Ron Moorhead stuff since then. I was like. That's what I heard exactly, yeah. but I would find the Reese cup raptor wrappers would be completely they wouldn't be ripped or torn open like with your teeth. They had been pulled open with their fingers and they had been taken out of the cup, and there's the wrapper and the cup laying on the ground, just like how me, you or anybody else would do it right and the Twizzlers. I would go there and count the Twizzlers that was still in the package, and there'd be one or two taken out of there about every other day. You know, because when I was camping down there, I was spending a lot of time down there. So, um, so I said, this is this just blowing my mind at the time. And well, now, then, after, wait, now, uh, before, before you go on here, when you got the audio recording of them actually doing the samurai chatter to each other, you hadn't heard Ron's recording before that, right? No, uh uh-uh, uh, no. So what, what did you think when you heard that? Were you still thinking it was Bigfoot, or were you starting to go, well, what, is there like a hillbilly tribe here that likes to raid campsites, or what the hell's going on? <laughs> no, I, I just, uh, after, well, I had my first sighting there. You know, I mean, it was... Well, but this was before you had your sighting, though, right? Yeah, this was before I had my sighting. Yeah, so at that point, you hadn't seen one. You were, like, thinking it was probably a Bigfoot, but you still weren't sure. But you didn't know that they could talk to each other and stuff. And then you hear this damn thing. I mean, were you still 100% on the it's a Bigfoot thing, or did you have any doubts at that point? Actually, that's when I started believing in them. That's when I was like, okay... This is, you know, this, I said, this is blowing my mind, you know, because I sit there around my camper in the morning, you know, I'd, I'd have my breakfast and I'd sit and listen to my cassette recordings. But I was listening to that samurai chatter, you know, and then, uh, well, I actually, after I had my sighting, I took the recordings to the Salsby meeting. When Doug Waller and them come down and did the the uh, investigation where my sighting happened at down there, but I took the recording in that night of the samurai chatter was where you can hear one of them walk right up there in front of the pickup truck and take a whiz. You could hear it going, <laughs> and it was loud. It sounded like a horse standing there. I'm not kidding you. And then it goes up to my pickup truck, and I had one of those antennas on top. I got I had a CB in my truck. On top of the truck, I had one of those magnet uh, antennas on top of it. You cannot reach it if you're six foot four. Maybe you could reach over and touch the bottom base of it. But in order to place it up there, you got to open a door, step up on the cab, you know, on the rocker panel, and then reach over there and kind of slide it over to the middle. And that's where I had it, on the top of the cab, right in the middle. And you could hear it clearly, this creature, take a whiz in front of the truck after the samurai chatter. This is maybe about an hour after samurai chatter. Walks over to the pickup truck and then just, flicks that antenna and you hear it go like (laughs) so i'm sitting there eating my breakfast at camp i heard that so i stopped what i was doing and i shut the cassette player off and i run over to the pickup truck and then i seen this huge handprint right on the pasture side window where to put one hand on the window then it flicked that antenna I was like, holy crap. So I was I was convinced then. I was convinced. Yeah, I could see. Yeah, that would be about enough to convince me, too. No kidding. Whoa. Did you get a picture of the handprint? 
Yeah, but that's long since been gone. I didn't, uh, I didn't have a group or anything back then, and I didn't store. I've been through so many phones since then because, you know, as a mechanic, um, yeah, they get broken a lot. Well, yes, before we go exactly. any further, let's go back to. So now we're coming up on about the point where you're watching some videos, you notice other people are habituating them, you've been feeding them, all this is going on, and then the the night comes where you you go down there and you see the one in the river. Um, Let's go back to that for a minute. What did his face look like? Uh, The way I described it, I call it the Amish effect look. <laughs> As you've seen in some of my videos, you'll see me driving down the road and pass Amish. So <laughs> he did not have a mustache like the pattern, like the Patty one did, which was kind of odd to me that a, a woman Bigfoot had a mustache. But, it, well, we've seen plenty of women with mustaches too. But anyhow... Yeah, I've, I've seen female on Bigfoot with mustaches, so I can believe a female Bigfoot with a mustache. Right. This one here had the Amish look. The face, you know, you could distinctly see the high eyebrow ridge or the protruded eyebrow ridge, but high where it crested back to the sagittal crest. Um, so this, his hair was, this was a male then, you're pretty sure? Yeah, I could see his... Uh, okay, so it was a male for sure. And yeah. how tall do you think he was? You probably knew how pretty well how deep the river was there. We had a limb hanging down. And just from the limb hanging down, wasn't in the middle of the river, but it went off to the river's gravel bar edge. When Doug Waller come down there, uh, it was like a week after my sighting, a week or two, something like that. I got a hold of them because I kept calling a BFRO and I could not get a hold of nobody. And and I just got fed up trying to get them down there. So I got a hold of uh, the Sospe group, looked them up online and, you know, just looked up groups in Ohio. And they said they did uh, field research investigations. So I called up Doug Waller. He come right down the next day and, they come down there, and he held up like a yardstick because Doug Waller is like six foot two, and then he holds up this yardstick to that limb. And I was telling him from that limb, because my line of sight where I was sitting in the chair and I had the the flashlight on, I could see that limb hanging down, but it looked like it was touching the top of his head, standing in the middle of the river. So when Doug come out there, he held that stick up to that limb that's dangling down there it was like uh nine foot eight inches somewhere right around there that was measuring his height with the stick yeah so, so that's what we'll, give or take a couple inches that's still a gigantic friggin big boy there yeah and it was barrel chested like crazy i mean there's a guy in the group there Sosby, uh steve Stephen Blair, he's an investigator there too. I I put him side by side, me and him at the meeting there, and I said, This is about how wide this creature was in the through the chest. So and, and the, you know, other people had their own sightings close up, said the same thing too. Stacy Hostetler, they used to have a radio talk show, but uh Stacy Hostetler had a um very very bad encounter he was up close had to walk by one with his head down he was afraid to look at an eye and this it was a big blonde one and uh yeah he had a terrifying experience with that and you know he's a very credible guy very soft-spoken and everything and to hear him tell that story hoof but anyhow so uh, I was telling them all about that there at Sospe meeting about, you know, the height, the barrel chest, and, the, you know, and everybody was describing the same thing, except, you know, all of them was different. Mine, he had short hair. Now, I figured being it was in August that, you know, it's, it's still hot out, 
I think they've shed their hair in the summertime and then grow it back thicker for the winter time. You know, that's it's just certainly my possible. That's one of those things about them that we just don't know. And you do see those variations, you know, it's, it's kind of weird because sometimes they'll see ones like down in Florida or something that have got like seven, eight sh- inch shaggy hair on them. Yeah. You're thinking, what the hell do you need all that hair for? <laughs> you know, we're in a friggin' tropical jungle. When does it get cold exactly? Well, yeah, there's other reasons they could be having that. But there seems to be, that's one of the things that seems to range all over the place, depending on where and when people are seeing them, is exactly how long the hair they're describing is. Yeah. And uh, it, it, his hair was actually a little thin in the chest. Around his knees, because I could see through the skin on his knees and see the circles on his knees. And I could see, you know, the nipples on his chest through his skin. I don't, I'm not saying his, his hair was translucent. It was just, he was, his hair was just not very thick that. on the chest. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and I hear that and a lot, especially with the people that see the bigger males and stuff, that they've got less hair in their chest and it's more obvious. And it could be a display thing or something, too. But before we go on, getting back to the face again. So he had the big brow ridge, the receding um, forehead. Did he have the sagittal crest? Yeah, yeah. And what, what yeah. about his face now? Uh, could you see what color his eyes were? Yeah, it was dark brown. Dark brown. Did you get any uh, eye shine or glow or anything? Well, they would, you know, I mean, dark brown, but from where I was at, yeah, I had, they had his eyes just getting, uh, I was getting red eye shine. Okay. Interesting. But when I first, when I first hit him, his eyes was like focused straight ahead of him and not on me. Right. So when I hit him with the, the light, his eyes was not illuminating until I could see his eyes turn towards me. Then they was red. Interesting. So <sighs> now the other question is: his uh, how much of his face was covered with hair, and what what did his nose look like? His nose was hooded like ours. Okay. Except it was spread out. So uh, kind of flatter, like uh, sometimes you get a description like an aborigine in Australia or like a boxer that's been popped. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And like I said, there was no hair except just, just like a. If anybody knows what an Amish beard looks like around here, that's what it looked like he had. But his beard wasn't long and scraggly. Mm-hmm. It was just, uh, I don't know, like you know, he had shedded some hair down thinner to him, but about I don't know, kind of like a German Shepherd's hair on his face you know so he had, he had the hair sort of framing his face so then he didn't actually have hair on his face not completely he just had a beard right. that was it okay interesting yeah and i've heard that description a bunch of times too there's another thing that seems to vary a lot depending on where you're at and what you're looking at and other details don't vary at all like the ones with the eyes and everything you just gave that's take yep you hear that over and over again that most of the time when people get a chance to see them in the daylight and they're close enough to see their eyes, they describe them as being kind of a amber, orange, or a dark brownish color. And then if it's at night and you hit them with light or something, you could get, you know, eye shine any color practically. But red seems to be when they're crabby. Like, you just caught them in the middle of the river with a spotlight. <laughs> yeah, and then he goes, wah, at me, and then curls wah. his upper lip. Wah. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, exactly. And that's what he did, but it just, it was louder now. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, a lot bigger chest. So, now, how long was it between when you saw this guy in the river and you started actually getting pretty serious about being involved with organizations and stuff like that until you actually had the incident with the trailer? Uh, That was in 014, so you're talking... um, about a year. Instant, yeah, in July that happened. I uh, don't remember the exact date. It's on the, that CD I've got. The first CD I had got taken out of my house. Uh, somebody broke in here. <sighs> well, we should actually play that for everybody. Okay, so then, um, so it was only about a year from the time that you had the original sighting 
from the time that you had the original sighting until you had this encounter. And, you know, you've already mentioned that, and I'll let you talk about it more afterwards, about how, like, maybe habituating him isn't the greatest idea. <clears throat> but for the benefit of the folks that haven't already heard this, uh, Sepi Saris, who's over in uh, the UK, um, does really great breakdowns and this sort of stuff. And she's actually taken the time and effort to go through and make a, a nice little short presentation on this whole 9-11 call. So rather than having us go on endlessly about it, you can actually watch her presentation on it. And then we'll get back with Jerry here in a minute. So let's go check that. I've listened to this two or three times, and I don't like listening to it. It just it scares the shit out of me. And I got there, and uh, and I backed up, pulled my trailer up, got it set up. This enclosed trailer I got kind of made it like a little uh, camper inside. So it's kind of nice, you know, and right. I kind of made it into a little camper. It was a pull-behind cargo trailer. If anybody's ever seen one, you'll see people pulling them down the road during closed or black or gray or white. And they're full of utilities inside of them, you know, tools. So, mine was set up, I put a window on one side and a window on the other side. But anyhow, I would set it up so I can have my quad in there, my gold prospecting equipment and everything. I had the truck parked there, connected to the cargo trailer. The cargo trailer was clear back here. The back doors was. They had double doors. So I went to bed about 9 o'clock and at 10 o'clock at night on the dot because I, because I had my phone on. It was illuminating like I'm talking to you right now. I was talking to 911 dispatcher as this thing's rocking like hell. Yeah, that's right. I'm but I'm at, uh, man, where, you know, he's, uh, I can't understand you, sir. Where are you at? My God, he's trying to push my damn trailer over in a church. Yeah, um, I, I quit a bit to waiting him. Okay, what's, where are you at? window here I'd say a little bit more than half of that's eight foot tall I can't reach that there's I'm on my tippy toes now and I can't okay I'm using this as a comparison the window is on this side this the window I had in my in my camper or in my trailer was a little bit smaller than this it was about half about like that I seen one eyeball go across and then I'd see the, the other eyeball come back across this way. So it had a hell of a wide spread of eyeballs that I can't even reach with my two fingers here showing. So when this thing was going back and forth, it was growling through that window. Not on this camper, but on my trailer, okay? But there was a handprint. The handprint was up here about right over here. I'm not talking from the window because my window is actually right in here. But on the camper trailer that I had, the cargo trailer, one handprint was clear up to the top of the 8-foot tall 
right at the edge with the fingers over. And the other one was clear the hell over here in between both windows. There's no way, no way anybody could have done that unless they did it with a ladder or something. I did not have a ladder out here with me. Are you still there? See the crazy dog. This is what he was he did the night that my camper trailer got attacked. And I'm gonna go through this and explain it to everybody. He was doing the same thing. And then at the end of the night there was all this fresh dirt right here. the trailer that is why there is banging on there it's not from the outside they had their hands up there spread eagle they're shaking it and with the palm print it was at the top you sure it could be people out there messing with you no yeah, it's not i think they be right on the back of my uh, window on the left side oh my god they're shaking around again there was two of them there, but there was only handprints on the one side, which was from the big one that left the 17 inch track. Now, are you armed at all, sir? No, I'm not. I'm just nothing. I can't get out of here. I have no weapon. Okay, Jerry, I got officers on the way, buddy. You said you saw somebody looking in your window? Two big red eyes. Two big red eyes? Yeah, I'm just like the one in the end of August. Okay. And you said you were, you were asleep before this and they woke you up? There was two of them. There was two. There, and it was so wide. One deputy was trying to take his hands and make them as spread out as he could. And you you couldn't even touch the top of this cargo trailer. My cargo trailer was uh, eight foot, eight foot something. Okay. Please stay alive with me. Yeah, I will. I will. <laughs> You couldn't put your hands up there unless you stood on a step stool or something. I got an audio recorder up there dealing a civilian. Hopefully, it picked us all up, man. Tell me what. I can do this shit no more. I didn't have really have money and stuff to invest in recorders or anything. Right. But all I went and got was a cassette tape recorder, recorder out there, and from Walmart and a microphone. And I was setting it up in my pickup truck to set the microphone out there, and I it right at dusk. You know, I was 
recording these tapes, which are only 90 minutes. One of my tapes got messed up that had some of the best uh, audio on it. You can call like that? I can't hear it yet. Okay. okay. Back in John down there? I'm talking long ways. You could have seen headlights coming from clear down there, okay? All right, right there's from the camp where my camper trailer got attacked, right across from the, the woods across the river. There. I'm going to let you guys see how long this drive is. got back in there, I left the, the trailer connected to the truck. All I did was just put jack stands behind it, and then I just took the front, you know, you got the tongue jack in the front. I left it connected to the truck. I just jacked the front up just a little bit to level it off. He said there's no closed gate back here. They were starting to come down the bike path, which is a mile back in there. And I'm telling them, tell them, don't come down on the bike path thinking drive in the lower drive. I told them that like four times. The drive down by the river. You know, this that said, well, we got a couple up on the bike path walking back to you. And I said, why they can drive back here? I drove my Z28 out there the night or the day before, you know. Okay, it should be all the way back into the driveway. Uh, he's inside, he's still pretty shook up. I was trying to headlights. Headlights. Yeah. Okay, now the officers are coming back there. So. <clears throat> My cargo trailer was parked right here. It had windows on it, like that window right there. My windows is just a little bit smaller that I had put on one side of the cargo trailer and I had put another one on the other side of the cargo trailer just so I can get air moving through there. But those windows was open and they're tinted, the ones I had on there, but they was both open. And the night that the, the, the cargo trailer got attacked that I used for camping and prospecting, on the ground, I had a jack stand here and one over here, okay? The cargo trailer was eight foot tall. I couldn't reach up there, no way, unless I was standing on something. I've been doing big foot reaches because I've been having, I had my sighting last August. Oh, you did big foot research? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hey, now there's officers coming back there. It might be them. Yeah, yeah. They're there. Everybody's doing nothing. Let's start from the 444. Yeah, 
he should be able to hear him. He's carrying on inside the trailer. But both jack stands had been pushed over and not completely over. It was off the bottom of it to level it up. And then on this wheel here, the inside of it, the dirt and grass had been pushed over that thick on one side and on the other tire over there on the other side. The outside of the tire, the grass and dirt was about that thick on the other side. That camper trailer had been shoved and pushed. I'd say from about here to right here. That's how many times they was rocking it. I'm still here, sir. Okay. I'm still here. 48, 42, uh, 292. Uh, I got the thermal flashlight on the big light. Every now and then I'll see one, and you see their eyes illuminating through the window. Okay. Okay. Huh. It hurt up and drinking, but I'm telling you, I'm not seeing shit. This shit happened. Yeah. I just want to get us the hell out of here. Somebody get me the hell out of here. So you're not going to stay back down there no more, huh? Oh, hell no. No. I'm done. Get him out of this night. No. No, I'm not going to stay down here no. I don't have any other night. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, you won't. They're going to be on foot coming down to your cab. Uh, they had a, a OPNR officer met up with them. Can they get to you from the bike path? There's a drive back here. I drove my, I drove my Camaro back here. I'm looking out the window and I'm going, oh, there's no one out there. What? What the fuck? Oh, there's no one out of here. Oh, I'm out of here. Correct. Is there another? Was there another one out there? There's no one out there. 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 I kept seeing the red eyes going back and forth across them little tiny windows I had in there. You came on and I put back the window up and said, I looked out the window. Yeah. You came. I don't know what the hell he came to do. He said, man, he said, there are two of them out here. Two of them out there? Yeah, two of them. One one window, no one the other one. Huh. Well, you guys got to get somebody down here. Yeah, we got people on the way. They're trying to get get down here to you. God. What are they fucking walking? Jesus Christ. their headlights coming down that lane, these creatures could see those headlights at least a half mile away. And it dead stopped right then and there. Okay, you should have officers out there now. There won't be I big. I got them. I got them. Okay, I'll let you get them. All right. You're welcome. 11 at 71 is Jerry Klein. I can be
They couldn't explain it. They, uh, they had a, a OPNR officer met up with them, and uh, he kind of he broke down there with one of them, and then they all searched around. One run off across the bike path there. He come back. He was cut up. Where he'd run through the thorns and everything. He said, "I can't explain it, guys." And then so the officer was by the bike pad that went over the bike pad. I don't know if he was in a cruiser or if he was one that come down the bike path. But apparently wanted to run up that way and then up the landowner's pasture field there. When he got over there, he was out of breath. He's a, he's actually on a Facebook page of mine, but he's under an assumed name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's actually he's really into the Bigfoot and thing now, too. So... <laughs> When the deputy sheriffs got here, they seen that print like that there, and he was like, holy shit. They just started to basically interrogate me, and I was in my socks, but I I got out of, I had, you know, I took my shoes off. I was asleep in the bed. I ain't going to sleep with my shoes on, and I started putting my shoes on, and one deputy sheriff went in behind the camper trailer. The footprint that I got from there was a 17-inch print, I think, is from a teenage, you can't say juvenile, teenage, maybe 18, 19-year-old Bigfoot. They found that print that was right on the side of the trailer that was being shook from the big one. Anyhow, they had me take my socks off. They looked at my hands, make sure there wasn't no mud on them. On my shoe, on my bare feet, you know, and then and I told him, I said, right before you guys got there, I said, these things are growling in the window at me. They drove away. All I asked them was, but before they left, I said, did any of you guys get anything on dash cam? And the DNR officer, officer said, I don't think your guys' dash cams were on, were they? Well, I know damn well they they kick on soon as they they start those vehicles up. So that's like pretty freaking scary, and uh, I just had one of my friends telling me that they had a sound tech guy that they know actually go through that and listen to it, and you can hear the growling in the background of the damn thing on the other side of the uh, of the wall from you shaking the damn vehicle and growling at you. Yeah, yeah, and. Um... Yeah, I could hear it, too. <laughs> yeah, I bet you could hear it. It's shaking the damn. But, I mean, it's like quite obviously this is not a fun time. You're terrified. You're having a horrible time. But your dog's freaking the hell out. You're wondering where's the cops because they can't figure out where the hell they are and where they're going. And how, why is it taking them so long? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this doesn't sound like fun. This does not sound like a fun time to me. Yeah, especially on dispatch. I've sat there and told them, uh, you know, to the dispatch on the phone i'm down at the river there is a lane gravel lane i just drove my camaro down here the day before or two days before something like that you can drive back in here and then they're saying they're sending one officer on foot down the bike path i'm like why are you sending them down on the bike path <laughs> we're send- oh hold just hold on mr klein we're sending officer squatch bait in first yeah, on a foot. mile on yeah, a mile and a half down there, back to camp, and they're sending an officer on a bike path. Okay, uh, TikTok, and then you hear the you know from the the game show on there, hearing that song going off. You know? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about like who drew the the short straw and had to do the walk in the dark by themselves to go investigate the Bigfoot attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should have sent the damn game warden that was uh, saying, uh, sitting there telling lies the whole freaking time. Yeah, he was investigated. You go chase the Bigfoot away that don't exist there, Mr. Know it all game warden. Yeah. Yeah, he come down there with them, and, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I asked him, I said, Did any of you guys have your, uh, your cameras on, dash cams on? And I said, No, we had them turned off. 
Well, I know damn well from other friends of mine that are in law enforcement. As soon as they turn that car on, it starts recording. Mm -hmm. From the minute they turn that car on till the minute they turn that car off. Unless they got there and turned the car off, or they coasted in there with the cars turned off. I don't know. But the cars was running while I was standing out there talking to the officers. So I knew that. So, yeah, it, it, and then, you know, the DNR officer rode down there with him. He left his vehicle up on top because he didn't know right where I was at neither. So he just jumped in the cruiser with one of the officers. But, yeah, it, it just didn't, uh, it didn't make no sense, you know. And then. Well, and, you know, then, you can see why it happened, though. But, see, here's the thing that we should let everybody know that you were, uh even though you're feeding these guys regularly, the night that this happened could have been a result of the fact that you didn't feed them and you were just on there sort of camping out and having a few beers and relaxing and weren't even thinking about it. And then they yeah. decided they were hungry. Well, that's the time that I've been watching other videos. You're talking a year later from my first sighting to the incident coming up to the 911 call, okay? You're talking a year later. So in that meantime, you know, I over the winter time, a lot of time on my hands at night. You know, I get off work, I get on the internet, and I'd listen to these other blog talk radio shows. Not here, you know, very a bear that you had on your show. Uh, yeah. Bear was on there saying you're just you're crazy to feed these creatures. Period. They they've been living here for God, we don't know how long. And why do you have to go out there and feed them? And the next thing you know, you're leaving that area, but somebody else has got to go walk through that area or it's state property or something. You know, it's a park. And then somebody else has got to come up through there with a pissed off Bigfoot thinking, okay, is this guy going to feed me or else I'm going to have to jack this guy up? <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. Then you get mugged by a furious Bigfoot that wants a Snickers bar. <laughs> you know, and Bear is absolutely right because, uh, you know, and, and and he should know because he's a bear and you don't feed the bears, right? But <laughs> all joking aside, uh, yeah. you know he's absolutely right about that. That's really incredibly dangerous. You don't do that to other, you know, potentially dangerous wildlife. Why would you? Why would you feed Bigfoot? Would you do that with a grizzly? Would you try and make friends with a grizzly by going and feeding them all the time? I mean, doesn't that sound like a little risky? I agree with yeah. bear, and and I can't blame you because there's a lot of these other people with those channels out there going. Oh, yeah, we just go feed them, whatever, and they hang around, and sometimes we get to see them or even get a, you know, blob squatchy picture or whatever. Yeah, but what happens when you stop feeding them? What happens when you get sick and you're in the hospital for a couple months and nobody's feeding them? Like you just said. Yeah. And even best case scenario, they're still your buddy, but you just didn't feed them for a day or so, and now they're hungry, and why aren't you feeding us? And I'm going to go shake your trailer and make you miserable until you give me some Snicker bars. Yep. Exactly, you know, and then, and so, I mean, there was a few other problems after that with other uh, uh, campers. After the weekend of my 911 call, after that weekend, I didn't go back down there for a while. I was, I was just, no, -uh, no, I'm done. I'm not going down there. Yeah, I can see that might the kill your interest in being down there for at least a couple of weeks. <laughs> Yeah, so Ron and Carmen go down there. They have a gray cargo trailer, just like mine. Oh, God. Mine was black, but theirs is gray, and they park in my same exact camping spot. Okay, they're prospector, gold prospectors, down there for the weekend. They get their camp set up and had their gold equipment out of the trailer and he's got his trailer converted over to like camper inside too but to where he can haul his gold equipment too and his was a little bit more way nicer than mine he's got an actual picnic table that all folds up to the wall they have cots that fold down off of the wall and it's awesome when you, you see it all set up in there but anyhow they was in there they had went to bed was in there about 10 10 30 somewhere around there about the same time and all of a sudden their trailer starts rocking 
violently. Ron's like, what in the hell? And then they heard the growling going on. So he's got a side door, same as mine. Ron kicks the door open, and he's got one of them uh, tactical shotguns, pump. He just starts blasting right into the ground, pump five shots right into the ground. And then all of a sudden, the shaking stopped. He shut the door, and, and Carmen, she said, what in the hell was that? He said, I don't know, but he said, I think Jerry's been down here feeding them damn things again. <laughs> Uh-oh, fallout from Jerry's feeding Bigfoot. Uh, so, you know, there's there's a good example for you right there. Whoops, I shouldn't have been feeding these guys. Now they're screwing with other people, too. So, well, yeah. I, had, I had told these guys, you know, I did not tell them what happened. I just told them what was going on. But Ron and Carmen called me up immediately after that, and then they ended up at the Sosby meeting, letting them know what happened to them with their account. You got two credible people here that's from the group. The same thing that happened to me happened to them, all because of my stupidity of feeding these creatures, habituating them is what they call it, habituating. Yeah. And if you look up in the dictionary what habituation means, it means you want to see something quicker by habituating something. Yep. So, say like a bear, uh, a deer, birds, Bigfoot. There you go. So that's what that means. And but to a naturalist, Bigfootist, they think that's all nice to be able to have flutes and pies and and then. Punched in, punched in your eye by a Bigfoot, you know, yeah. All you're doing is setting somebody else up for, you know, to, to get harmed. Yeah. Seriously, and, and I did it. Serious. Yeah. Well, hopefully nobody did get, like, seriously harmed and there won't be any further fallout from it and they've decided to not pester humans for, you know, free hams anymore <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's pretty enticing when they get the human to give him a ham. That's probably got their attention. Wow, a whole ham. Go, go shake his trailer. See if he's got another one. They do get, uh, we have our annual hog roast down there. I put, I, I put the last ones on for the past, I would say, six years up until a two years ago, and then I put one on last year, um, the hog roast for our gold uh, club down there. And I throw all the goodies off of that hog. I'm talking the bones, the head, everything. It goes right over the hill onto the little, I, if you watch my videos, we got a little ditch line back there. I throw all that stuff right back in there for all the critters. And, and I'm sure, you know, I wanted to get down there to, uh, uh, about a day or two after we had the hog roast, but we still had some uh, people that's prospecting down there camped out. And I wanted to set up an audio recorder, see what kind of activity, you know, was going on there with the audio recorder at night. Because I can't, you know, between work and everything else, from the time that I can get out and do research and everything, I, I just can't get out there and go set you know, on the picnic table under the gazebo there and try to film all this at night. I, it's just too tiring to me to do all this. That's why I set up my audio recorder traps, you know, and uh, and I love to listen to my audio recordings. Uh, I know a buddy of mine here, he, he's got one, but he's got the one with the SD cards, which I had two of them just sent to me, but he likes to just plug his SD card into his, his uh, computer and then be able to sit there and just watch the spikes and then go to them. That way he don't have to sit and listen to all that. But to me, it's relaxing. It's a stress reducer to sit and listen to my recordings, you know, until I finally get to that one good spot. And I'm like, oh, man, that, what the hell was that? You know, <laughs> yeah, you hear the howling going up, and then it switches from relaxing to exciting all of a sudden. Yeah, for sure. Especially man. when you get a damn good tree knock on there, you know. Yeah. 
So it, so this was, <laughs> so then you changed your attitude about feeding them. And, you know, to get back to that again, I mentioned this in the, the last show with, uh, that I did with Cindy, that, you know, people just don't have that much time. In order to do this properly, you've got to have time and funding. Because if you want to do it properly, you've got to go Jane Goodall it and go live with the damn things. And build right. up for them and just be there constantly. And who the hell can afford to be out in the woods for weeks or months or even years at a time, hanging around with some Bigfoot troop to try and get close enough to them to build up some confidence so you can interact with them? Well, nobody. Actually, scientists could afford to do that, but they're unwilling to do their job. So it's exactly. left to citizen scientists that have no budget and no time and can't do it to cover for their lazy butts. So there's the problem. So why do you have these weird, you know, well, let's just show up and feed them all the time. Well, because you don't have time to be there all the time. Or right. let's show up and do some wood knocks and howls and, you know, trick them into coming in closer. Why? Well, because you don't have time to be there all the time. And that's why this sort of methodology is being used by people. I'm probably one of the few not funded Bigfoot researchers that's actually been able to be out in the woods for months at a time, just camped in a hot spot and there every night for months. Right. How many other people have even had a chance to do that? And most of the top Bigfoot researchers have never done that. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, <clears throat> it's like the guys that I'm with here in Ohio, uh, you know, uh, Coshocton boys, I call them. They've got their own group, too. But we get out and we hit different areas, and we go to my areas, we go to their areas, and uh, the thing of it is, we are out there putting boots on the ground, and, you know, it's not like, I don't know where it's, the reason why I do these videos is for people that can't get out and research. Yeah. Um, you know how many people that I have sub subscribed to my channel say they're wheelchair bound or this and that and the other is keeping them back or they have MS and you know they get on messenger and they send me great messages all the time thanking me you're taking me into the woods Jerry with you that's how we watch this I have a big screen TV I watch on uh, YouTube TV and you take me out every time I'm going out there with you she said, you know, I've got one woman, but she all the time is telling me, well, I love your kitchen videos, but still, I love it when you take me out to the woods, you know? Yep. And that's that's all part of reason why I started up a YouTube channel. Not to pecker, argue, or nothing. I'm not getting into that. But anyhow, it's, it's uh, people that can't get out there and wants to learn more about these creatures that we can bring the information to, you know? I know I have a bunch of uh, faithful fans, followers, listeners, viewers that are in that same boat. And the interesting thing to me is some of those are, are people that actually, you know, spent decades in the woods. We're avid hikers, fishermen, hunters, whatever. Some of them were Bigfoot researchers, and they're just so crippled up now, they just can't get out in the woods and do it anymore. Right. And they're just so happy that somebody else is out there and that they're filming what's going on, and they're showing them the evidence they're finding. And like I said, it takes them out, out there with you. They feel like they're out there again, and they're getting to see what's going on, and they're getting to experience it and stuff. So, I mean, right. that's like, you know, one of the main things that we can do to, to just help the, the viewer community in general is, uh, you know, have that kind of stuff going on. That's why I love channels like, you know, let me do a plug for Kelly Shaw here, RMSO. I love his channel. He, when he gets out and does actual Bigfoot research in the field in one of their hotspots, they generally find something. And a lot of what he does is like reports. He'll just go to an area where there had been a report from however many years or days or months ago it was, and he'll try and get to the exact location, film the location, and then he'll read the encounter report. So it's like taking you right to where the encounter happened so you can see it, and you can hear exactly what the witness said happened. And, you know, I think he's he more than once, I think, but at least once he got a, the witness that actually had the eyewitness encounter and took him back to the spot and filmed them 
um, talking about it on the spot. And this guy was really nervous. You could tell even with like three or four other people there, he did not want to be there. That was awesome. But, you know, I mean, the guy's been out with uh, Survivor, man, uh, and, you know, uh, he, he gets out there and puts boots on the ground just like you do. But I hear the same thing about his channels. One of the reasons people love it is because he's out in the Rocky Mountains. All the places he's investigating are just gorgeous. And so yeah. you know, it, it doesn't matter even if he if he actually finds Bigfoot evidence or not. In a lot of these um, episodes that he does, because the scenery is so beautiful, the shots he gets of all the animals and, and the wildlife and everything are just great, you know. So it's it's just visually appealing. You can turn the sound off and watch it. It's still fun. Um, you know, right. the fact that he's right where a Bigfoot sighting happened and telling the encounter is icing on the cake. And, you know, this is this, this is the same thing, only it's, you know, you're actually out there doing research. You're getting video. You're getting wood knocks. You're getting audio. You're finding tracks. You know, I, I, I love that kind of thing. You're not only taking people into the woods, but you're finding Bigfoot evidence, too, you know. Right, like, exactly. Like I said, Kelly does that, too. Uh, you know, he just spends a lot of his time doing the encounter um, eyewitness sightings and stuff and going back to those same areas trying to find more evidence of Bigfoot there, which is great. But it's like you've got your own areas where you know these things are around and you just go there and do your own research. Yeah. We, uh, my, my friend Jay, Jay Fouch and Larry, <clears throat> me and Jay went into an area that would just blew my freaking mind from the arches, the tree arches and the axes we found. And holy cow, I did a video on it. And then we found that tree that was stuck in the middle of the trail. It was an old gravel road is what it used to be. You could see the gravel on the road. And it was pretty thick. And there's a, there's a cherry tree had been carried there and shoved into the middle of the road. But there was no, no stumps around there that that tree come from. Oh, I remember no. this video. That wasn't too long ago that you shot this one. And yeah, you guys were on it. Nothing had used that road in like a hundred years, probably. Yeah, exactly. And um, Jay said when he, you know, when he was younger, they didn't have it blocked off down there where we started out at. But you had to have a four by four to get up in there. And they used to go up in there and uh, go mushroom hunting. But they could only drive up so far because there was washouts all over the place. And uh, and they'd get to a washout, stop, and then get out and walk the rest of the way up in there and go mushroom hunting. But he hadn't been up there for a long time. And when we got up in there, it was like, holy cow. It was, yeah, <clears throat> our head was on a, that was know, another one head. of those. That was one of those videos that I enjoyed watching because I was right there with you going, Yep, there's an arch, there's an X structure. Hey, check that leaner out over there, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, you know. It was constant. Were, exactly. And when we walked in there to it, was, and we got on a, a flattened out trail. No deer scat on it, no nothing. Just a flattened out trail. You could see the leaves, and it was perfect. And what it did, that trail would go in and out of, like, um, uh, you know, an ambush area is what these trails would do. And they'd go to an ambush area where there was a, you know, the uh, a bunch of brush piled up to one side of a tree there with the leaners and everything coming down off of it, almost teepee style. But it was ambush points, and you could see that. But I was thinking, but why is it so flattened down here? And I thought, maybe that's their trail. And then as we jumped, we kind of went over the hill there a little bit below that. There was the deer trail, uh -huh. deer, deer prints, deer scat all over the place. You know, and I said, there we go. That's what that was. Yeah, you found their little access to <laughs> favorite hunting spots. Yeah, that I see was that so over here in Patty Canyon, too, over in the, the Pine Labyrinth. I was near one of their, their spots where they like to deer hunt. And there was a whole bunch of game trails and went through there. And then there were some suspicious ones. They were just like you were saying, there was no other sign of any other animals on them. There was no scat, just big mashed down spots. And they led to all all these little ambush spots. There was a couple of really good ones in there in that pine thicket. And you got to think, too, where we found all these structures at, right in the middle of all these thorns, okay? Not only that, too, in peak season, 
those thorns, that's blackberry and raspberry bushes, you yeah. know. And, so they can uh, sit there and munch. They got like munchies to eat while they're waiting for deer to come by. Exactly. You know, peak season in, in the summertime, and uh, ambush spots there. It's It was a perfect scenario with no houses around or farms around there for a mile or two, you know. So, you know, we try to get back in the remotest areas we can. And uh, I'm talking not remotely, you know, 10, 12 miles off the beaten path. Um, We try to get back up in there just far enough we could get off the path for a while and then find these structures and everything. Um, You know, we're getting older, too, and these hikes are, you know, we're trying to keep them to a minimum because, you know, we all got health problems. Uh, one of our guys, he's diabetic, so we got to keep an eye on him, make sure his sugar don't drop. And if it does, you know, we got to kind of hurry up and get him back. We carry food and and, uh, and candies with us for him. But uh, Oh, so that's but the that's- cover story now. The Snicker bars aren't for Bigfoot anymore. Now they're for the diabetic guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, got it. You still got the Jack Lake's beef jerky there, just in case? <laughs> yeah, that we got to throw as we're running away <laughs> throw, from the Yeah, butts, you throw it over you your know. shoulder as you're fleeing the opposite direction. That's yeah. What Jack Lake's beef jerky is for, apparently. Yep. <laughs> we throw a package of Jack Lake. We got it planned out. So if we're being chased <laughs> out of there, you know, we throw a package of Jack Lake's over our shoulder and a package of Red Band chewing tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> that would make the little the little people happy too. They'll grab up some of that you would loving you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, um you've had plenty of experiences since this trailer thing. You've been at it for a few years and you've interesting things that you filmed. Um I was wondering if you'd be willing to tell people about the the uh, game cam photo that cannot be shared. Uh, and what you think it might be? Uh, well, I've I, I you know I shared it out there on my YouTube channel, but it's the it's it's a game trail camera picture that I took the SD card in, and then I had the picture blowed up, and it's not paradigm because when I first seen it, it was like holy crap, what the hell? I mean, I thought it was a kid at first. What the hell is a kid doing out there walking around? And, you know, you could, on the time stamp, it said it was 648 in the morning. Well, that early in the morning means it was just starting to break daylight a little bit. Mm-hmm. Because in the background, you could see the lighting above the trees. So it was just starting to break daylight a little bit, you know. But you could see it. And then all of a sudden, I see another figure up there peeking up over the grass because that grass was pretty tall. It was uh, high as my head where I set that camera up at down in the swamp. But there's this juvenile looking, it's all black, but you could clearly see there is two nubs on its forehead, though. What's got me stumped? I have never, ever seen anything like that in my life. You can see the eyes and nose, the cheeks, the the sastral crest on it, you know. Um, but it's got two nubs. And then there's some, another figure in the middle of the picture. Now that, it, it's hard to, it looks like it's turned sideways because you can see the high eyebrow ridge protruding out there. But that's all you could see in part of a nose. But there's, you know, it's, it's standing in the grass, that tall grass. Yikes. Yeah. Nubby forehead, weird looking things. And this is down by a swamp? Yeah. Yeah. It's in one of my research, well, was one of my research areas. The landowner uh, sold that property. But they used to give me permission to go in there and set up my trail cameras and stuff. And I even let them know what for, you know, what I was in there for and everything. Because they've had weird stuff going on their farm that was like a mile and a half down the road from there. Yeah, they were probably curious too, if there was some weird thing living out there. It might be better to know about it. 
I was curious. I was actually asking you about a game cam picture that somebody else got that they don't want to show of uh, a, th- a thing that was uh, basically snarling at the game cam. Oh, that was Carmen. Okay, remember I referred back to Ron and Carmen who got their their uh, trailer shook. Okay, mm-hmm. she was in Walmart. She was. This was. Uh, they come to a Sospi meeting for the second time. They What's come there a for the second meeting. Let everybody know what that is. At Southeastern Society for Bigfoot Investigations. Okay, that's the that's the group Doug Waller uh, set up out of Cambridge, Ohio. And uh, but anyhow, Carmen was telling a story at Sospi meeting. And Ron was with her, too. Ron said, I've seen the picture, too. Because they was in Walmart down there. They was actually in Cambridge there, but uh, uh, they're uh, from Caldwell area. So, um, but they was on their way to go gold prospecting, but they had, she caught up with a friend of hers there at Walmart. And said, what are you doing here? And friend told her, said, I had bring my husband's SD card here to Walmart and get uh, um, these pictures made up. And she said, uh, what, a big buck or something like that? I said, no. And she said, hey, just take a look at it. So the woman pulls the, the pictures out of the envelope and Carmen's sitting there looking at it and all Carmen could describe to us was demonic. Okay. So I seen a post. I seen a post. She described in detail what it looked like. So its mouth had wrinkles around the corners of its mouth. It had tufts of hair on top of its head. And it had, uh, it had fanged teeth. You know, just uh, two fangs, you know, canines. Yeah. And she said it's got a hold of the camera and it's got its mouth open like it, it's getting ready to take a bite out of the camera. But it's showing its whole face. But its eyes was glowing red, too, in the camera because it was it was a, either a dawn or a dusk picture. Right. But there was a series of these pictures. So after the meeting, I told, you know, Carmen was telling me this. I said, you know the people? She said, yeah, it's my best friend. I grew up with her. And uh, she, I said, you think I could talk to him? She said, yeah. I got there. I got to talk to the people, but they would not show me the pictures. The guy said, kept telling me they're locked up in my safe. He said, I don't want this getting out. I just don't want the publicity. I don't want it. And he said, you know, I don't want people here knocking at my door at night. Uh, I don't want all these crazy people. It's Bigfoot people or this and that and the other. I just don't want it. He said, to me, this ain't nothing but a curse. But then he told me the backstory on that. The day that they was out there checking their trail cameras, they left two trail cameras back up in there, but they had went and picked that one up. But they was out there bow hunting. And the brother-in-law come out of his tree stand, come down there and got him, the landowner. Told him, let's get out of here. He said, why? He said, let's just get out of here. So apparently, you know, apparently this thing was out there in the woods with him at the time. The brother-in-law seen something, but he was too scared to say what it was, you know, speak up about it. God. And he's telling his brother-in-law, which was the landowner, you know, let's just get out of here. And then he said he had a strange feeling come over him at the same time that he was saying this. They said, we got the hell out of there. On the way out, they had that one trail camera, and they went ahead and pulled the SD card on it, and then got out of there. They said after they saw what they saw in there, on that picture, or on the, the SD card, they never went back and recovered they, he said he's never been on that property since, and that section of property is thinking desperately about selling it. So, damn! So we should go back and recover that camera wherever. It is. 
Yeah, you know, and I think he said he left a couple of them back there. So damn, that'd be totally worth recovering. I bet they got some interesting pictures on them. Yeah, the thing of it is, from the road, you know, the property was a section up behind his house. It was like uh, sixty or seventy acres. I could see that piece of property from the road as I was driving away from their house. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. It's, they had a mowed path going back through there, but it was mostly thicket with, it had patchy patches of hardwood trees in it. Mm-hmm. But he had one single path going back through there. It used to be part of an old railroad track going through there. Okay. And the tracks have been removed, but he Real kept that. Still there. Yeah. Right, exactly. And he kept it groomed up to go back in there to go, you know, deer hunt them. But I was looking at that going, gosh, you know, I didn't get to see the pictures, but I'll tell you what, after what I heard, you know, I, you couldn't have paid me to go on that man's property to do an investigation. Uh-uh. No, I wish we had a little bit more description or detail on it. I mean, it's hard to take even a guess at what it could be with this, the scant detail that we got on it, you know. I mean, like, I'm not saying it's a gugwe, but it's a gugwe. Exactly. You know, that's that, well, you know, finally, after what I'm starting to learn about these creatures and I've, the stuff I've been listening to you, yeah, it's a gugwe. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like a lot closer to the description of that, unless it's a dog man. <laughs> you know, you would think, though, if it was uh, something that looked dog man like, like canine, they probably would have said dog man or something. Right, and uh, it's like uh, weekend four last was dinner at the Sosby meeting, and Fred Slogo is looking, which he's the he's the uh, he's a the uh, what would you call it? He's head of MUFON in Pennsylvania or in West okay. Virginia. I'm sorry, in West Virginia. That's West, West Virginia. Spooky. Pennsylvania, blah, blah. That's where Dracula lives, right? No, that's a spooky state. Yeah. Um, uh, Fred Saluga is the the state director, I guess, for MUFON for West Virginia. Okay. But he does a lot of investigation stuff there. And he got called on a picture, too, that he, that somebody got off their trail camera. And he said it was the weirdest Bigfoot he had ever seen. He said it wasn't. It wasn't set back in the brush where it's a grainy picture. He said, it's one of them that somebody's just scared to let go of the picture and let us show it to anybody. But he said that this thing had kind of a snout to it, but it had canine teeth. And I'm sitting there, I got a pin in my mouth because we was, you know, taking notes and everything down there. <clears throat> and he said, what do you think it was, Fred? And he said, I don't know. And I said, it's a gugway. <laughs> I had that pin in my mouth. Everybody goes, what? Everybody turned around at the same time. I said, it's a gugway. <laughs> and they're all like, what is this gugway thing of which you speak, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was then, or did you give them a description, or what did they say? Well, some of the people was there, you know, uh, watch my videos, too, you know, and they said, yeah, we know what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. He said, that's, that's that guy, uh, what, uh, Duke Sullivan talks about that all? I said, yeah, that's <laughs> how I found out about it, you know. Yeah, like I, I was just that, telling you before we went on the air, I got somebody up in Alberta that sent me a Gugwee sighting. It happened in like 2014. And there's apparently a bunch more of them that they're getting ready to send me. So it's not like people aren't seeing these things. They just don't know right. what the heck they're looking at or what they're called. All right, brother. Uh, yeah, where you're at, it's like, what, almost 3 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, I th- it's after now. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm two hours behind you, so it's just it's only like not quite the middle of the night here. Yeah, 347, and i got to be get going here about an hour and a half, so I still haven't put my clothes in the dryer yet. So. All right, well, we got to let you go and take let Bug outside and feed him and yep. slug down some more coffee and... Go check your videos, band, delete, repeat, band, delete, repeat, band, delete, repeat. (laughs) 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 
Well, like thanks. I said, it's a new hobby of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Roll squishing is an art and a hobby. Yes. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. And uh, You're welcome. Hope to have you back again at some point in the future if you'd be willing to come back on again. Yes. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Sounds great because... I know otherwise I'll get pestered. I've had a, a bunch of your fans pester me all the time. How come you haven't had Jerry on yet? <laughs> yeah, they do me the two. Keep trying. Well, keep on. <laughs> <laughs> we had tech problems for a couple of months that kind of slowed that process down, but we finally got them. Yeah. Up. And yeah. then I have all the previous people that everybody wants them back again, too, you know? So it's kind of like there's only, right. it's only so many shows per month, guys. I just can't do that many. So be patient. All right. Get around to everybody good here eventually, and finally we got Jerry on here, and I was just happy that you were willing to come on the show and uh, share share that uh, awesome video that uh, Sefi put together for you from your nine one one call and talk about your first encounter and stuff. But honestly, folks, you should go check out his channel, Jerry Klein YouTube. He's the Knox County Bigfoot guy. He's got a Facebook group too. And he turns out lots of videos. This guy is boots on the ground. He's out in the woods like practically every weekend if he can get out there. Even in the winter, even when the weather stinks, even when it's raining, even when he's got a broken ankle, he doesn't care. He's still out there, and that's one of the reasons that he finds things. Um, so his videos are really cool and worth looking at. Definitely go check out his channel, and uh, we will be having him back on the show again. So thanks for being on, Jerry. You're welcome. All right. Bye. Never. So make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Uh, don't flip off the mountain giant. Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't punt the puck, would you? And for God's sake, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee. See you later, folks.